Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will Will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However, that drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Companion planting, aka the fact that plants can actually be friends. Plant friend. You might have heard of this term, which essentially is about figuring out which plants get along famously and intentionally planting them together to get your best yield from your garden. And more importantly, a fabulous natural pest management method. We all need more pest management methods when it comes to gardening, am I right? The most famous dynamic duo of the companion planting realm might be tomatoes and basil. They're definitely friends for a reason, as they taste so delicious together, as well as how they thrive when they're planted together. And while I joke about plant friends and plants that are friends, there is a lot of science and strategy that actually goes behind companion planting, and a very earth-centered philosophy at its core. I have gotten to know the farm managers at the Lodge at Woodlock's unbelievable regenerative farm. 
These guys are obsessed with soil biology and cultivating a garden that not only benefits the lodge's guests who eat their homegrown salad greens year-round, but creating a garden that benefits the local wildlife and ecosystem in Holly, PA, where the lodge is located and the greater world. Get ready to fall in love with these plant nerds and their passion for companion planting. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, the Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Plant friends, if you followed me on Instagram this year, you know that I've been having a love affair with the Lodge at Woodlock, which is a luxury resort and spa that's about an hour from me. It's located in Holly, Pennsylvania. Plant friends, this is this place is planty paradise. Both Billy and I are so in love with it. It's so beautiful. It's this amazing state of the art spa nestled in the woods, 500 acres to be exact, and it has a private lake. And the entire spa and lodge is just deeply rooted in nature and biophilic design. There are views of trees everywhere you look, huge green walls, and really beautifully kept house plans all throughout the estate. The activity schedule which is so wild, you could literally be doing activities all day long if you wanted to, has forest bathing, foraging lessons, garden tours, and even axe throwing. You can check that out in the recent reel I posted about the last time Billy and I went when I got a bullseye from axe throwing. The Lodge gets you outside and it gets you out of your head. I started my love affair with the Lodge when I was looking for a place to take Billy for his 35th birthday. I talk about the obsession that Billy and I have with cold plunging on social media a lot. I don't know if I've mentioned it here, but Billy and I love cold exposure therapy. If you've seen people who do cold plunges in frozen lakes and cold showers and bathtubs, Billy and I are those people. We do cold exposure every morning. And I found the lodge because they have America's first snow room, which is basically a really large refrigerator that's filled with snow that has beautiful music playing and beautiful imagery on the walls. And it allows you to get really cold and then go get really warm in their Himalayan salt sauna. And I just knew that this experience would like knock Billy's socks off because he loves cold exposure so much and sauna so much. So I surprised him with a birthday adventure there. All of this is documented on my Instagram in case you want to go check out Billy's reaction. But within 20 minutes of being there, I'd never been there before. Within 20 minutes of arriving, I was so in love with how luxe everything felt at the spa. I immediately booked my sister's bridesmaids retreat there for the end of March. So I went in January. I went back with my sister and all of her friends in March. And then I decided to come back again for my birthday in early April. So it's safe to say any life event that happens, I want to go celebrate at the Lodge at Woodlock. It's really the most beautifully planty place on earth. Beyond the spa and the sauna and the hot tubs, one of my favorite parts of being there is interacting with the farm managers at Blackmore Farm, which is The regenerative farm on property that grew 9,500 pounds of produce for the Lodge's restaurant last year. And it's going to expand that number this year because they're going through a massive expansion. It's literally acres and acres of food, farming, grow tents, greenhouses, and orchard. And when I learned that all of this production was run by two guys, I was on a mission to find them and interrogate them about how on earth they're growing so much food in so few acres and their unique approach to growing because I was noticing bat houses and bee houses and this just like very eco-friendly approach to gardening as I wandered around their farm. Since I've been there multiple times this year, I've been lucky enough to have met Sam, one of the dynamic duo you're going to hear from today several times, and I've gotten to know a lot about this incredible farm that they run. But what most impressed me about this farm is not just the amount of food that him and his partner Derek are growing, but how they're doing it. They are so passionate about Companion planting, succession planting, planting, they'll say in this interview a lot, adding more life to life, the commitment to the land that they are stewarding. These are incredibly passionate guys 
who are obsessed with soil science and biology. They're borderline obsessed with ensuring that they grow food on the land with the highest integrity and are constantly finding ways to give back to their local wildlife and area. And they really tell us a lot. And even though they're growing at such a large scale at the farm, we really drill down to the basics of companion planting. And you're going to walk away from today's episode with actionable steps that you can start doing in your own garden. I have a major aha moment about maybe three quarters of the way into our conversations about how I could be utilizing my little grow bags that I grow on my balcony. So these are really smart guys growing at a really large scale that are helping us distill this concept of companion planting and applying it to however we're growing in the ground, in grow bags, in raised beds, in your local community garden plot. They're just the greatest. I'm so excited to introduce you to them. So without further ado, here's Sam and Derek. Welcome to Growing Joy, guys. This is a very special live taped episode of Growing Joy. The first one I think that I've done in a couple of years. We're at the most magical. We're sitting in the middle of a dormant orchard, which I kind of think is a little magical. You kind of sit here. We see this incredible orchard with all of these trees. There are no leaves. There's no fruit. But there's just the promise of what's to come. Possibilities. Yeah, possibilities. It's very poetic, actually at Blackmore Farm at the Lodge at Woodlock. And I'm so lucky to be sitting down with the heads of this epic operation. Eight acres, I believe you said, growing so much of the food that gets eaten at this very fancy spawn resort. So before we dive in, guys, can you each introduce yourself and tell us how you became one of the two heads of this farm? Sure. Yeah. My name is Derek Braun, and this may be my ninth year at the Lodge at Woodlock. And uh, originally I had studied culinary nutrition and dietetics. And thinking, man, my food didn't taste all that good in culinary and (laughs) went to the nutrition program and I realized the health of the food all starts with the soil and uh, found agriculture, you know, that way. When I came to the lodge, I mean, the vegetable garden was filled with mostly just flowers and and pollinator friendly stuff and inviting in the bees and the monarchs and kind of without erasing that to, to go into the production of vegetables, interplanted and tried to keep as much of that food source for the others the non-humans as much as possible and kind of just stumbled into a what I think is a new style seems like a new style and production everywhere and feed and everything and yeah so it started as flowers and pollinator plants then what was the next stage like how many stages would you say there have been since you've been here for nine years so I guess you can count the amount of mistakes that were made and it's one big stage, I guess. It's hard to picture. I know before Sam came on board a couple of years ago, it was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. It was uh, too big of an operation for me. And my, it was just me and my wife at the time. And a orchard that wasn't getting any sort of attention. And, and that's where Sam came on board and it made a huge difference. But really, yeah, just a focus on production. But again, while the more space we gave to the pollinators, it seemed like the better the vegetables were doing. And you know, learning that throughout the years, throughout the seasons, that it doesn't, it didn't matter the square inch of vegetables to increase production. It was the square inch of just life, and, and as much as we could possibly squeeze in to a particular place. Like I said, feeding everybody and a, a habitat for everybody, and just that butterfly effect. Yeah, for lack of a better word, right? If it started with the monarchs. Yeah. And what about you, Sam? So I'm Sam Linamutha. I actually started agriculture geese 12 years ago. I came on board here at the lodge. I think four seasons ago. And yeah, I met Derek that that my first year of agriculture. He was my manager there. He then went his way. I stuck around. I managed that place for a while. And uh, upon leaving that job, I called Derek as my good friend and said, hey, I'm leaving my job. And he had a grin on his face and was like, cool, let's do it. So, you know, I think that's that's really where the phase starts for me. I think you had phase one in the early times. Right. And then Pre-Sam and post-Sam. Yep. <laughs> Jeez, I think every year I've been here has been a different phase. But yeah, my passion is the orchard. I'll grow anything, anywhere. I don't really care. But I think my specialty is hard, woody perennials like fruit trees and berry bushes. Uh, it's just something at the last farm I spent a lot of time working on and working with and finding interest in it. But that doesn't mean I can't grow lettuce and carrots and stuff like that. So um, even as Derek mentioned before, I think I spend 80, 90 percent of my time up there doing that. But it doesn't mean that my passion and heart right. isn't down here doing my thing. So speaking of the orchard, you started rattling off. Is this what, a couple of acres, this orchard? It's about two acres inside of this fence. Again, you're looking at a section here that's not technically under cultivation. We do take care of it. We do put things in there. I mean, you pick strawberry patch all the way on the other side. That um, That's a new addition as of last year. Yeah. We're still working on that. And then also adding an area then for like a perennial nursery. 
from anywhere. We can just start trees from seeds. Uh, trees, you go on the internet, you buy them. They're $25, $30, $40. I actually just, just bought an apple tree for 70 bucks. When we have the space here inside of the fence and we have the knowledge to do it, why not do it ourselves? Yeah. And you were rattling off so many different fruits and berries that you grow just within these couple of acres. What Can you give us a glimpse of all Totally. The I've actually amazing? memorized it over the years. Okay. So there's apples, Asian pears, European pears, peaches, plums, cherries, apricots. We just started a section of pawpaws, which is a native fruit yeah. around here. In between of all our trees are berry bushes, blueberries, blackberries, raspberries, gooseberries, currants. And that just kind of opens up the window of harvest. Typical orchards, one variety of apple, you're, you get two weeks worth of harvest where we start harvesting berries, starting with currants, and typically by end of May. And the last variety of pears typically coming off end of October, early November. So now we're looking at months worth of harvest where the land is actually giving us something, just a little reward for our work. It also forces us to be down here more often. Yeah. I can see if something's going wrong with apples, if I'm down here harvesting currants, uh, and it just uh, allows us to be more in tune with what's going on. And then again, there's, I mean, there's hazelnuts around and all sorts of other stuff that we plant that uh, aren't technically for production. But as Derek said, let's just put life in anywhere we can and Natives are great. The hazelnuts are native. They keep squirrels away. We can mm -hmm. do all these sort of things. So uh, really looking at the ecosystem mindset and saying, let's just pile it all in there and let nature do the rest, essentially. I love that. And wow, you just literally encapsulated the, the topic of today's conversation so beautifully in just this orchard. I definitely want to talk about your epic food, edibles, vegetable program, but companion planting. You know, you just perfectly, as you were walking me through this orchard, every row has like so many different plants in it. So why don't we just start there? Can we talk about what is companion planting and why, what are the different reasons that companion planting is so important for people who are growing small scale gardens in their backyards, on their balconies, or epic programs that you have here? Yeah, I mean, typically when we're setting up a bed or even, you know, on a perennial scale in the orchard, there's the all-star, the main act, and then everything else around that main act in support and sometimes it's in direct support. It just aids in growth, pest deterrence. But sometimes it's just a, a shallow-rooted allium onion family next to a deeper-rooted, you know, like a potato or something like that. And, you know, things that can be both productive and share a space without encroaching on each other size-wise, nutrient-wise. There's a simple kind of uh, formula that we come up with is a fruit, a root, a leaf, an aromatic herb. And then if you've got a space for it, a flower. Oh my gosh, wait, say that again. A fruit, a root, a leaf? An aromatic herb. Okay. And a flower. And that's in a couple square feet? And then repeat. Okay. Yeah. So you figure the if the tomato is your, your all-star, your main act is your fruit. If you want a root veggie, they say the, the parsley family is the best companion with tomatoes. So we think carrot, you think celery root, think parsnip, all in that same family as a root vegetable, leafy crop, something in the culinary world and working for a restaurant if we could f squeeze a parsley plant anywhere as a leafy crop. Does lettuce count for leafy as well? Certainly, yeah. You know, just timing wise of a cool loving lettuce and, and a hot loving tomato family often doesn't pan out and the parsley could be a little bit more productive. And we just find these things out as, like I said, as we go along. And then aromatic herbs, the, that's the fun one. That's the easy one is uh, if it tastes yeah. good together, grow it together. And so basil and, and tomato, I was something that I had tried to pan and put together just because I'm lazy and I don't I only eat tomato with basil and mm -hmm. vice versa so I'm not going to two opposite ends of the garden I'm going to put them right next to each other just later to find out basil is the main deterrent of tomato hornworm Isn't that interesting that's an intuitive thing that you knew and then there's a reason for it It's something like our tongue is just one tool to mm -hmm. kind of pick up on their their relationship but that relationship exists in the soil and in the airspace around it and it was that first year of the tomato and basil that the Japanese beetles were going after the basil. And there was this companion of a borage flower, edible blossom, Got beautiful it. blue flower. I am obsessed with borage. I have just started growing it. I had never heard about this herb before until this year, but it's a very medicinal plant and the herbalists are obsessed with it. And I did a bunch of herbalist interviews. Everybody kept saying borage, borage, borage. So I started growing it in my hydroponic it is the most exquisite oh, yeah, plant. Pretty. It's pretty. so delicious. It tastes like cucumbers. Yep. I make borage tea like every day now. And it's really good for your nervous system. We live about as it like reseeds itself. I mean, talk about the companion planting. It's also an awareness of looking at what your garden's giving you. We call them volunteers. Mm -hmm. But as you're planting, I mean, you, if you see a borage popping up, skip that spot. Work around it. Allow okay. that to do its thing. And I mean, when's the last time we planted borage? I don't think I've ever planted borage on this farm. And yeah. there's just borage everywhere. everywhere. It's a vigorous uh, And again, flower. just having that 
know with all to just go, that's boards, leave it there. I mean, we do it with dandelion. Okay, let's just go around that one. You know, dill, cilantro, those, those are weeds in our garden. Hey, just work your way right around them. Kale's another big one. So even, you know, we could talk all day about what we're putting in the ground, but also just going, this is what's already here. Make that part of it. And as Derek said, we're pretty lazy. That means, A, I just put less work in by not having to pull the thing out. Yeah. And then even more less work by not having to replace it with anything. And then at the end of the day, we didn't grow any borage, but there's still plentiful of borage. Right. And you can insert that with kind of any crop, but borage is one that just kind of does its mm-hmm. thing. Yeah. Oh, my God. I freaking love it. It reminds me, too, the idea of the volunteers. I gardened a couple years ago with a retiree named Melody, and she had the most epic garden, similar size to your the fenced-in garden that you have over there. And she had volunteer tomatoes, volunteer, like she had volunteers of everything. And she was always like, no, no, leave it. I mean, she'd have tomatoes growing out of cracks in her, like the stone stairs or she'd have like zinnias popping up out of nowhere. And it was beautiful. It was a very, you know, it's a very controlled garden, obviously, but to allow that aspect of wild in your garden, I think is really important. Territorial Seed Company's winter catalog is officially out, plant friends. I know we are focused on our summer gardens right now, but I highly encourage you to extend the joy in your garden this year by extending your growing season through fall and winter. Territorial Seed Company is a big supporter of year-long gardening, and their winter catalog features a large selection of flowers, herbs, vegetables, and fruit varieties for fall and winter gardening. You will learn so much about plants just from reading their catalog, I swear. You will discover foods that you didn't even realize you could grow in your zone in the fall and winter just by exploring this gorgeous winter catalog that they put out. I pour through their catalogs every year because it's obviously very interesting. It's where I shop for my seeds and my plants, but more importantly, it's a really great resource for learning. You learn so much about all of the different varieties of foods that you can grow. And because the catalog is online this year, then all you have to do is buy whatever you want on the website. And that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy. So go to territorialseed.com slash growing joy. You can check out their winter catalog. Have a seamless online learning and ordering experience. Plus, since you're a Growing Joy listener, you're going to get 10% off whatever your heart desires to grow on the website. So once again, that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy for a 10% off discount on all territorial seed items. Once again, that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy. Before we dive more into companion planning, I wanted to ask you both have kind of referred to the motto, the mission of Blackmore Farm and kind of your approach to gardening. And you keep saying, if it lives, like, let it put as much life there as possible. Can you speak a little bit more to that? Because what you are doing is pretty unique and I think kind of can be replicated in small scale gardens. So I'd love to hear more about that philosophy, how you kind of cultivated it and how you're living it here. Yeah, I think that our garden or our farm is not confined to our our eight foot deer fence that There's this, all these spaces around it and in between them that are, that's the wild. That's the host site for amphibians and reptiles and insects and all things that are part of of the ecosystem. They're all in cahoots. So to be able to really, you know, like I said, be protected from the deer inside the eight foot fence, but just thinking that the farm exists outside of that, there is a a reverberating effect that goes on outside. And it just seemed that the more we thought about that, yeah, we just had better and better luck with the vegetables. So again, just birdhouses and bat boxes and native solitary bee housing and just try to think of all of those things. And like I said, a reverberating effect and and the rest of the job gets easier and easier, it seems. Yeah. To me, I always just come back to this idea of just like life just breeds more life. What Derek and I do are just the catalysts of life. If we can just be the humans here to say, okay, let's just keep adding more and more on top of each other. Then the things like birds come through and, you know, it's the food web. You learn about it in sixth grade. Yeah. Uh, it, we're adults and, uh, I mean, a lot of people forget about it. Yep. Like, no, this is still very real and it's around us. And the longer we do this, the more things we start to see coming our way. You know, it's the, the past farm I was at it used to just be a meadow. And by the end of it, it was a 30-acre orchard and you walk through and I didn't know any of the birds. They're all orchard species of birds that like hanging out in orchards that you don't see in forest and you don't mm-hmm. see in meadows and just watching that shift. I was there for long enough to go from, hey, there's not much going on. We're just working like dogs out yeah. here to then, hey, this is coming in. Now this is coming in. Now this is coming in. And you can 
I mean, by the end of it, we were having problems with beavers, which was like, this is kind of awesome. Right. Beavers weren't here before. Yeah, yeah. just like golden eagles and all this stuff. It's kind of like, where was this 10 years ago? Yeah. Well, it was somewhere else because this was just yeah. a meadow. And we've begun to just put the life in there and watch it build on top of each other. And I mean, we companion plant to keep insects away, but we also try to attract things like birds that eat insects. And it's all the web of life. And, you know, it starts with healthy soil and just builds out from there. And I think our philosophy just follows that. Try to make it seem as natural as possible. But in the meantime, just put more life in than you're ever taking out. Yeah, it reminds me of a couple of things. One, a movie that made me cry. The Biggest Little Farm. Did you guys ever watch that movie? And they just talk about how like putting in as many species as possible. And, you know, there's that great moment where they have a slug problem. And so instead of putting insecticide, they get ducks and then the ducks eat the slugs. And then the ducks also like, I don't know, do other great things. Well, for... And then you got the duck poop to use as manure. Exactly. You got the duck yeah. feathers to go do whatever, exactly. you, you know, make a nice jacket and then the yeah. duck egg and the duck meat. And exactly. right there, it just now the uses are piling up on itself as well. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. And it's that other concept of being a steward of the land and letting the land speak to you. Because I think a lot of us, you know, when we're gardening, I am so guilty of this. I like tomatoes and I like basil. I garden for tomatoes. That's like all I care about and herbs in the summer. And even in the last couple of years, as I've noticed, I'm still gardening in grow bags. I, I don't have I don't own land that I can cultivate yet. But, you know, just thinking about, OK, what else do the tomatoes need? Incorporating pollinators, starting to grow flowers. Last year was the first time I grew flowers. Seeing the hummingbirds that came to my gorgeous flowers. You know, I want to give a shout out to a listener and friend of mine, Pam. She lives in the city of Boston and she has this, she had this vacant lot right next to her house that she got permission to start gardening. And it was nothing. I mean, it was like grass and dirt. And she created this beautiful garden, mental health garden for herself. And what she said is one of the biggest joys is it's brought so many birds back to her town, you know, to her area of Boston. And I think that's, so important. Even if you're just doing like a little plot of land, you can put a couple of native pollinator plants and restore some of the environment that we've all just like taken for granted so much. It's a beautiful way of thinking, how can I be in service to this space and to this area instead of just making the space be in service to me, which I think has definitely for me been like a real mind opening experience just in the last couple of years where I used to just be like, I want tomatoes. I don't care about anything else. And now I'm like, what plants can I get for my hummingbirds? Because I want to be like the crazy hummingbird lady sure. this I mean, year. You're seeing it right now on a massive scale. It's what we want is corn. Exactly. And you're watching hundreds of acres just go to nothing but corn. And yep. we've been doing that now for 80, 90 yeah. years. And Boy, now you're beginning to yeah. see these people go, wait a minute, that may have been a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. And then it's, you know, young folks like us who buy up 100 acres of desolate corn and say, no, put in Asian pears and blackberries and grow the asparagus mm -hmm. in between. And that's when you see that stuff come back. I mean, that last farm I mentioned, that was just an old dairy farm. It was yeah. grass, grass and rocks. And that was it. And that guy put a lot of time and effort in and he's got something special now. It took him a while, but he's got yeah. something special. Well, patience. That's another thing. Gardening. Talk about a hobby that teaches you patience, man. It's not a, a rapid rewards nope. experience you Mess up at your all. tomato crop this year. Better luck next yeah, year. Yeah, better luck next year, you know, or planting perennials. If you want to plant peonies, that's like a four-year investment. Even one of these trees, you put the tree in the ground this of year, course. you're going to wait six years before six you actually years. eat anything yeah. off of it. Pairs Smile. for your heirs. Pairs for your heirs. Pairs for your heirs. That's amazing. I've never heard that before. I love that. So before also we dive in, you know, I just wanted to draw attention because I think it's very inspiring and I think a lot of listeners can take something from it. You know, neither of you have degrees in agriculture. You don't have soil science degrees. You don't have any of that. And you found your way here. So can you speak just a little bit to like what that initial journey looked like for people who might be curious or feeling really disconnected to gardening and growing in this kind of method? Yeah, I'll start off. We're earthlings. Yeah. Sure, we're humans, but we're all a part of this earth and that's what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. You know, people think this whole garden thing is we're in control and we're doing all this stuff and changing things. And most often that's when it goes wrong. The more we can just realize that we're just another species of animal yeah. roaming around the planet, but sure, we have an intelligent brain in our head. Let's, cool, we can do things. That's that. You know, most people ask me, what book can I go to figure this all out? And they get a ninth grade biology book, go sit in the forest right. and uh, take a look at it and go, holy smokes, this, this has been happening for millennia. This will always happen for millennia. And the more we as people can go, okay, let's just do that. You know, let's, let's not take the dead plants out of the garden. Let's leave them right there. They're mm -hmm. just going to digest and feed the worms and the microbes and the nematodes and all the critters in the soil just to make it all happen all over again. 
That's also a lazy approach. Well, if, <laughs> if dead plants make soil, why would we ever remove them? Let's just leave them right there and we'll put a plant right next to a dead plant. And uh, now the death is feeding the life and the life will eventually be the death. And yes. uh, oh that's God, so what poetic. happens right here on Earth. So poetic. I love that. Yeah. I mean, I feel very fortunate that I recently learned about the Lodge at Woodlock and I came here for the first time in January for my husband's birthday because I wanted to take him to the famous snow room because we're annoying cold plungers that like our whole personality is the fact that we love to cold plunge every morning. Ironically, you did the snow room in January. Yeah, ironically, too. So funny. I loved it so much. I came back multiple times, but I met you in January and I got to tour the farm in January where it was like nothing and you still had your corn. You had all of your dead plants were still in your garden. And it was so funny. Now we're revisiting in April when we did this interview. This is going to air, I think, in May or June. But in April now, you've cleaned up the beds a little bit. You're starting to, you know, incorporate some new stuff. You're making plans for your expansion. And now I'm like, well, I've got to come back in July to like see. I feel like I'm cultivating a long term relationship with this farm. That's exactly what gardening is. It's a long term relationship with a piece of land or your pot on your balcony or your grow bags. And I mean, it's like fine wine. The more you work, the better it's going to get. Okay. I mean, it's I. It's funny. You just walk past all those dead corn stalks. They're piled up because that'll be the base of a of new bed. Uh, oh, of, of a new no, bed. we'll okay. pile that on ground and throw some wood chips on top, throw soil on top. Boom. Start putting plants in the ground. Yeah. That's pretty much how it's built. Yeah. And you do that. I mean, I guess also people call that the lasagna method, right? Yep. Yeah. I love that. And then, Derek, did you want to say anything about kind of your, your non-traditional path to running yeah. an eight acre farm? <laughs> I think the uh, Derek in his young 20s was, I was getting upset about the state of food and Derek was pretty upset in his young 20s. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was, uh, you know, <laughs> you hear about a biotech company, it's patenting a seed and things yeah. that go on. And yeah, it was, it was an anger. And, but not, I, there's only so much that like any yelling or screaming can do about mm-hmm. that. So to find a first at, at where Sam and I had started, the Anhill Farm, to, you know, grab onto a piece of land, even if it wasn't mine, and just enhance it, that was kind of the protest. It was mm-hmm. a lot more effective, it seemed to grow organic food for somebody than it was to, mm-hmm. yeah, yell at a company for not growing organic yeah. food. And it was, once you could take any sort of the negative energy, the aggression or anger and turn it into something positive, it was mm-hmm. pretty addicting at that point. And just to open up the books, the gardening books, and and just start to feast on all the knowledge that was out there that I just wasn't interested in going to find until that interest that clicked. And, and did you take courses or did you literally just read a bunch of books? It was, yeah, I mean, it's, I remember my first any type of plant book was a wild foods book. Actually, mm-hmm. when I started working on the farm, it was March, and I was told I can get room and board, and you know we have food to eat as part of like you know the stipend. And I looked around, I was like, "There's nothing growing." <laughs> <laughs> and we hadn't even started seeds yet, and you know diving into the wild foods, and there was luckily some chickens that were laying, starting to lay some eggs at that point, and making nettle omelets and dandelion, and then going to get ramps and. Oh, it's about to be ramp season here, too. Yeah. I'm so excited. Mine are, actually, mine are up at my house. Yeah. And, yep, they just started. All the ones I planted last year Amazing. took. I'm That's real so happy cool. about that. So, yeah, it was. It wasn't until getting into, well, I told you I had that nutrition background and starting to, like, it was a buzz at the point of probiotics and beneficial mm-hmm. bacteria within the biome of the body. And just to find out that it was almost identical what was going on in the soil and that the soil is just a big digestive tract. And you start to connect those dots and just felt like I had discovered something. You know, it had already been there, but yeah. for me, it was Pandora's box. Yeah. I love when I've just started like my gardening journey or my love of plants journey. And then you talk to people, you know, from the 70s, even with houseplants that like houseplants used to be all the rage in the 70s and they fell out of style and then they came back into style in the last couple of years. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm learning all these life lessons from my houseplants, blah, blah, blah. And, we you know, when I talk to the older generation, they're like, yeah, we know, like you're not discovering something new you're yeah. you've just we been were, asleep we were trying to tell yeah, you yeah we've been trying to tell you this for 30 years like that you've just been asleep but it's cool there's a real awakening and it sounds like you're coming from this awakening from the food side of it and you're coming from the more sustainability kind of planet side of it earthling side of it as you like to say so i really want to kind of dig into your harvest your knowledge for our our listeners about companion planning because when you toured me In January, I was blown away by like every single inch of your beds are utilized for something, whether it's to eat or to feed the soil for some sort of purpose. And I think it's so freaking cool. So it's a fruit, a root, a leaf, an herb, and a and a flower. And a flower. If you got the space. If you got the space. That's one of the things. Something like we had talked about with the tomato, the borage. It's a big plant, and Mm -hmm. if you you end up running out of space, you can cross that one off. But just stick with productive veggies. But yeah, discovering that through 
Somebody had said that borage decreases the acidity of tomato, mm-hmm. and it makes your tomato sweeter if grown near it. So tried that out, and it was the second year of that basil tomato, and the year before the basil got just demolished by Japanese beetles in the early part of the summer. And to find out that they actually preferred borage over basil, salvaged my $14 a pound basil mm-hmm. for the restaurant. Borage was, the leaf was, you know, turned into Swiss cheese for a few weeks, but the blossoms were still there. It didn't kill the plant. What's that name when you plant a plant to be the kind of plant that gets eaten? Symbiosis? Whoa. Sacrifice? It's got like a, it's a sacrifice plant. Yeah. There's a name for it. I can't remember what the name is. Crop oh, trap. Crop trap. Crop trap. Crop trap. Yeah. We found it. We found it. Trap, crop, trap, trap. Oh, don't Google that. We're good. Yeah. We're good. Crop, trap. Okay. Trap crop. So borage for you in that five is your trap crop. So it's going to pull all the insects to eat it. You're going to save that basil. And then you can still harvest some of the borage. Or even if you don't like borage, then you can just have borage be the trap crop and then not eat it. What other collections of plants grow well together? I'm happy that we discussed. Wait, what flower do you grow with your... That would be the borage. Oh, the borage is the flower. Okay, cool, cool, cool. In that that particular guild. With cucumbers, I mean, this year we're going to add the bush bean. That's a little experiment for us, just realizing, A, you have the nitrogen fixation Mm -hmm. of the legume, but they're also not large plants. So you have cucumber, dill, right there's your fruit, your herb. The flower is always the nasturtium. In fact, we found that, yeah, you have a nice edible blossom right there. Trust me, our chefs love edible blossoms. But that cucumber beetle is much more attracted to the nectar of that nasturtium than your cucumber. So sure, I mean, folks come around here and they say, boy, you have a beetle problem. And as you take a look around, you look at all of our cucumber plants, they're perfectly healthy. Beetles are simply just feeding off of this flower. And yeah, we still pick those flowers. You look inside, there'll be clusters of beetles. You just shake them, they fall out, send them to chef. So now your flower is acting as the turn. It's also So the beetles don't ruin the flower. They're just eating the nectar of the flower. They're just like a bee would. In fact, they're pollinators now. Right. Now we're using the thing that we don't like to our advantage. Okay. In the meantime, those nasturtiums are just like, they're hummingbird crazy. I mean, a lot of times yeah. those, in those high tunnels that last year, I mean, in the mornings, there'd be eight, nine, ten hummingbirds oh just hanging God. out, oh nailing God. these open blossoms. So, I mean, right there, it's, that's a great pest thing. Sure, you have this trap crop, but it's like it's happening right next to it. So, yeah, dill, cucumber, nasturtium. Again, with this year with the bush bean, we don't really typically do a root crop. No, I tried tried out beets as a root crop, and it could give it a go again. I think it was just cucumbers kind of taking over the space. So in this one, the cucumber is the quote-unquote fruit as well. So you're starting with the star of the show, and then you're building the surrounding. Are you also taking, I mean, you have to obviously take into consideration the size, right? Because, like, if a cucumber plant is a vine that's going to climb up. Precisely. The dill is growing kind of out with its, like, bushy craziness. and then. Nasturtium is a lower plant. So you've also got to take into consideration the size of these plants because you don't want to overcrowd them. And that's what I like about companion planting is just about space conservation. Yeah, that seed packet's going to tell you your cucumber should be 24 inches apart. Um, I agree with that, but I don't agree that nothing can go in between it. In fact, dill fits kind of perfectly in there. These nasturtiums kind of fit perfectly in there. Uh, I I always bring it back to the forest. I mean, you got these oaks and maples hanging 75 feet, 100 up. And then here's high bush blueberry and and witch hazel. That's It's never going to grow more than 16 feet tall. Well, that oak is my cucumber. And this next one here, that's the dill. And then there's this whole ground layer, which is that nasturtium crawling across it. And you can take that and just insert it anywhere. Cucumbers, dill, nasturtium, tomato, basil, onion. The three sisters, which is just like quintessential. Yeah. Your corn's growing up. Your beans are climbing up that. And you got this stuff growing underneath. So with companion planting, I mean, we experiment. We just look at plants and say, that looks like it grows. I mean, spinach, it just kind of grows along the ground. Let's tuck that all in there. We just walked through our, you know, that fresh planting high tunnel. That was mm-hmm. peas down the center, going to grow straight up. Now kale is going to grow 8 to 12 inches tall. And then there's lettuce and spinach right in between all that. Mm-hmm. But now no one's really competing for vertical space. And in the meantime, once you begin competing for the horizontal space, what we say, well, you're late. Go harvest it. That's food. Harvest as you're pruning. Harvest is your pruning. Pruning is your harvesting. Uh, And at the end of it, sure, you're going to have to go down your row and pick each and every leaf individually. But, I mean, we'll harvest. The two of us will harvest for two hours. And by the end of it, we're both looking at it being like, where was this? I mean, there's a lot of days we look at our, our greens and we're going, where are we going to get salad from? And it's not until we get on our hands and knees and take a closer look and just start working to the end of the row. Mm-hmm. Again, by the end, you're going, I got, I got 10 we pounds got so here. How much salad. do you have? You know? right. And by the end, it's, it's almost like an accident at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, and now the philosophy is us just, just put the plants in. And now all our job is really to do is go get it. Yeah. So we've established companion planting is amazing for pest 
mitigation, man, pest management, not pest eradication, because I think that's a very important Pushing difference. and pulling. Yeah. It's great for getting the biggest bang for your buck in terms of being able to pull something out. I have also found it's great for moisture retention in the soil because having that bare soil, you're going to be way more exposed to weeds and you're going to be way more exposed to the soil drying out, especially me. I mean, grow bag gardening, you're just like watering your grow bags 100 times a day. Are there any other benefits that I haven't mentioned? Timing, 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 timing. Mm -hmm. I mean, for us, we're a small garden. We got a lot of people to feed. Uh, I think timing is super important. I mean, I'll grow lettuce next to lettuce, but one lettuce is two weeks old and the other one's four weeks old. And just trying to get something out of your space at all times. Mm -hmm. Uh, You go out there and you plant your broccoli. You're going to wait three months for broccoli. So plant broccoli and cilantro. Uh, Now the cilantro acts as that pest deterrent and you're harvesting cilantro within two weeks. You're making guacamole. Boom. Off to the races we go. And then, hey, guess what? Now your cilantro, by the end of it, your broccoli's bulking up. Your cilantro is now bolting, turning into a flower. Boom, check that off the list. Uh, We'll wait for that to go to seed, collect those seeds. And now we're into broccoli season. Last one that we stumbled upon that I thought was perfect was strawberries and spinach. You're getting them both in the ground this time of year, early April. But you plant those bare root strawberry plants. You're not not getting strawberries. I mean, your plants aren't large until July. Mm -hmm. So put the spinach in between. You're harvesting within two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. Your spinach doesn't like the heat. It's going to bolt immediately. We'll get that out. And once you get that out, what are you looking at? Nice, established strawberry plants that are now bulking up to take up that space. And now our perennial patch is just off to the races. And now, again, we've gotten something out of that space while we're waiting. We're no longer watering and weeding and doing all the labor that goes around taking care of these plants because it's all just happening through harvest. I can pay attention to pests on strawberries if I'm standing right there harvesting spinach. And we're a lot more in tune with issues, I guess you will, simply by being there. Interesting. So there's a strategy of because you're surrounding a quick harvest around everything you're growing, that's also always a daily opportunity to check in with all the plants. And you're going to find that issue with the broccoli faster because if you were just growing broccoli as a monocrop, you're not going to be checking it as intimately as you would be checking if you're like next to it pulling spinach out. Now on my list is check broccoli for cabbage worms. We're, we don't need to do that. We just write harvest cilantro. So, right. And hey, while you're there, keep an eye out keep for eye cabbage out. worms. And if we see a lot of it, that's when that gets put on the list. Go take care of cabbage worms. Yeah, I think another example that's really worked out for us in our winter growing in the structures, in the high tunnel structures, we're limited in space. So we don't, there's only so much we can pack in there. So that's really forced us to kind of think about that square foot and how much we're getting out of it in an effort to have more than just greens and herbs for the restaurant. What one of our prep cooks called, when are you growing? He asked us when we're growing vegetables because we just kept bringing greens in. I was like, they're vegetables. Well, to get potatoes in the ground as that, you know, kind of that all star on the plate plant a potato in the ground and it's going to be another, especially in the winter, maybe five, six weeks before that leaf even pops up. Get those greens like those potatoes don't even exist right right into those beds. As the potato starts to emerge, you just harvest the greens that are around the potato leaf. Three, four weeks later, now that potato is starting to take up its own space within the bed. You've already harvested out a bunch of herbs and a bunch of greens, you know, as now it becomes and emerges into a potato bed. But don't call it a potato bed and watch bare soil for the next five, six weeks. Interesting. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. So this actually reminds me of a question we got from a listener that says, can you plant greens over onions or garlic? Sure. So onions and garlic grow underground just like potatoes. So you're saying, and are you planting seed potatoes? Are you planting that potato by what? You're putting a little bit of the potato in the ground. A Correct, of the potato. Yeah. So you're putting the potato underground, you're covering it, You're not worrying about where the potato is, trusting that the potato is going to pop up. And then what about, though, say you plant a green that has a shallow root system. 
when that potato sticks up, are you removing the roots as well or you're just removing the greens? We make it an effort to never pull a root system okay. if we can help it. And I would tell any gardener out there, do not remove roots from soil. Okay. Ever. Because you want those roots to decompose and turn Correct. into nitrogen. and Yeah, okay. it's the, the relationship between roots and bacteria and fungus and worms. It's we as humans can't ever understand it. Right. So we just attempt to never remove that relationship from the soil. Okay. Leave it there. We know how hard and clay our soil is here in Northeast Pennsylvania. I mean, each one of those decomposing roots is these little tubes and pockets of air. That's just going to be another host site for microbial life. And we call it chop and drop, where it's just go at, at the soil line and chop the plant and that material right back into the walkway or into the bed, depending on what it is, and compost on top of that and keep planting. That's wow. Lasagna over the whole season, essentially. I love that. Uh, chop and drop, chop and drop, chop and drop. And every time we reset, just add a little more compost and everything dies, chop it down, throw compost on top, keep planting. I want to hit you guys up with some listener questions. I talked about that onion and greens. We talked about the onions. But I don't think we hit the answer, really. No, I think that was, I, your answer is yes. Yeah, and I mean, that whole onion family allium is the, like, that's like the pest deterrent of pest deterrent of right. pest deterrent. I mean, and garlic each, too, right? Garlic too. Each yeah. one of these trees has garlic growing underneath of it. Garlic deters the pest for apples called plum cuculio, unless you live in east of the Mississippi or west of the Mississippi where plum cuculio doesn't exist. East of the Mississippi? Never mind. Whatever. If you live in, why do you live in Washington? Not on our side. The, the number one apple producing state is Washington state. Why? Because this bug does not exist. So again, they hate garlic. Let's plant that around. So are you lining all the beds just with cloves of garlic at the beginning you of the... You could. I mean, we would prefer in our garden. I mean, scallions. Scallions. I mean, again, we talked about the shape and the size of plants. Scallions are great companions anywhere. Again, you have that pest deterrence and it grows like a pencil. Uh, I mean, we start two trays, trays 128. You can say we start 250 of these plants every two weeks because we know that we, you know, you have an established broccoli thing and you got two trays of scallions. We'll go slam them in the ground. Go pop Fine. them in. Pop them in. They're not going to take up much space and you just get that added. Everyone hates alliums. Again, they're here. You know, I saw a listener question about roses. Roses, they get hit with Japanese beetles a lot. They get hit with all sorts of bugs that hate garlic. Plant garlic, chives, scallions, onions, all those things around your roses. You will deter those pests for the most part. And then you're going to be everybody's best friend when you harvest all sorts of garlic the following year and giving all your friends And then you know, you'll be nobody's garlic. friend because you'll stink like garlic. Right, and then you'll stink <laughs> like, time. right. But even on our philosophies, like we don't purchase fertilizers or anything. I'll tell you, we love spraying stuff. The sprayer is not the problem. It's what we put in the tank. And we have our own, I do it in air quotes for you listeners, pesticides that we make. And number one ingredient, rotten garlic and rotten onions. We'll find these giant slimy scallions at the end of the season, dig them out of the ground, put them in a bucket of water. We put the top on. We'll let that sit for a month. And uh, when you pull the top off and stir that around, nothing wants to be near it. And then you're going to spray the leaves of the plants with Correct. that. Correct. Now, I'm not going to spray that on my ripe tomato. I'm not going to spray that on the right. broccoli I'm about to harvest. <laughs> but when I'm putting my new transplants out and they're two inches tall and they're most susceptible to pests because mm -hmm. they're these little babies, hammer them with that stinky stuff. Over time, a little rain and it'll grow out of that. But that's our protection there. And what it was was just a byproduct. What do you want me to do with this rotten head of garlic? Well, we'll throw it in that bucket. And then water and time. And next thing you know, you have a stinky substance that deters everything, essentially. And what about smelly plants in general, like sage, lavenders? Because I found I tried to plant a deer-resistant garden. We have so much deer. I mean, we live in the Poconos slash Catskills. The deer are crazy here. And I found they ate everything, even the plants that they said that were deer-resistant, except for the lavender and some of the salvias. Sure, deer don't read that list. Yeah, yeah. yeah deer, deer do not. Read. Deer do not give a shit. Deer, I hate, I hate deer. I gr when I moved to the Catskills and I saw all the deer around, I was like, they're so cute. I yep. love the deer. And now that I've been there for two years, I'm just like, uh -huh. fuck you, deer. But I mean, I guess I my house you. looks like a plant prison. Just yeah. Every every plant's got its own little cage yeah, around it. it and... needs to be. Oh my god. <laughs> so you spent all that time the other year putting up a fence just so they could slip through the fence, and then last right. year you're tearing down the fence. Yeah. Like oh this stupid thing doesn't work. But yeah, I mean that's there. I mean deer deer are one thing. Deer won't eat your alliums. Right. So. Lavender and sage and the salvias, those smelly kind of gross plants. Do you plant those here? Yeah, I mean, our sage is kept in our high tunnels. Sage is kind of a tender perennial. We don't really have much success growing it outside. In fact, over the last couple of years, we haven't had much success growing it at all. But us just saying, hey, that's a tender perennial. Let's put that in the high tunnel. Even if it can survive our winter, it would just be much more apt indoors. But you bet your bottom dollar, that's a bed all the way on the edge where those rodents in the winter want to come in. They're greeted with sage. Interesting. So you're planting it strategically Correct. there. 
You know, even plants of daffodils. Rodents hate daffodils. They burrow through the ground. When they hit a daffodil bulb, there's something that smells in a daffodil where they turn around and go the other way. There's plans to put daffodils all along our high tunnels because every rodent within a mile of this place, when it gets cold and snowy, they're going, get inside of that greenhouse. Right. So if we can just have walls, barriers. Uh, of the to daffodil keep those tubes, in, not even uh, the flowers. Precisely. And then you get to enjoy the flowers and ultimately harvest them and the spa gets to enjoy them. Totally. For deer, I don't have many answers. Yeah. Deer, no, deer just suck. I purchased at my house. I, I don't have a fence at my house. I have motion censored sprinklers mm-hmm. and they work. Yes, I've heard that's a good deterrent. I like them. They keep the feral cats out of my garden. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of cats around my house yeah. and they just use my garden as a litter box. And then my okay. chickens go scratching through. So yeah, I started with one. I loved it. I now have six or seven of them. And then it's also entertaining watching, you know, your buddy come over and he's walking around with beer, checking out your garden, he's getting just smashed. Just getting smashed, with being like, where's this all coming from? Maybe I just have this thing with getting yeah. people soaking wet, dumping, <laughs> dumping water on Derek, <laughs> launching water at deer and stuff. I have another listener question. I have a couple more I want to hit you with. Just along the lines of the onion potato discussion, one of the listeners wrote, can I start seeds in pots that already have something established? So what's your recommendation for if somebody has planted, maybe they went to the garden center, they picked up a tomato seedling that's already established. What's your practice there? I mean, are you guys direct sowing most of your stuff? We are direct sowing almost nothing other than carrots and parsnips. And from time to time, we'll do like salad radish and salad turnips just because they're 45 day crop Mm -hmm. going fast. But I think the answer is yes. I mean, that goes back to the timing thing. You figure, like you said, we talked about cucumber or tomato having that 12, 18 inch spacing and not calling that empty space. There's going to be that collar around the base of that plant that eventually it's just all root system of the tomato. There's not much that's going to like succeed in that first six inch diameter. But if it's a big pot, why not? And be able to companion within container. I think it's a great idea. You also don't have to plant your tomato right in the center of your pot. Maybe you throw that over towards the edge, keep it two inches off the edge. And now the rest of your pot you have mm, all that the space deep too. roots will grow towards throughout the bottom of the pot, sure. but then you put the shallow. Yeah, the roots top. are going to do whatever they yeah, want. So if you're idea. just moving your plant off to the edge, you know, you can imagine your pot and the tomato in the center is going to take up, you know, that's six that inch idea. collar around it. But if you shift that over again, you don't need six inches to the edge of the pot. You can right. keep that two, three inches off. Because the roots will just fill it in. Precisely. And then again, obtaining more space for something else. I'm going to do that with my grow bags there this year. Go. I love that idea. What about, we had a listener wondering, what to plant with annual flowers like zinnias or sunflowers? Yeah, so I guess we're always using those as the companions for other things. But so what do they make good companions? Well, we love the zinnias again as another Japanese beetle food. Again, okay. not enough. They can't do enough damage to kill that plant. And it doesn't matter after July and the Japanese beetles are gone. You're having beautiful blooms for the rest mm-hmm. of the year. I find that typically the beetles eat the leaves first, so now they're stripping the leaf off, so you can just cut it and already have a perfect cut flower for in the vase. Beautiful. Oh, beetles doing the work. Yeah. Okay. Zinnia, I feel, are a very underrated cut flower. Oh, that's great. Like, and food. there's so much variety. Unless you yeah. did these lime green ones. It's like They're incredible. That, that's, just, that's cool. And you just like, they grow. You can literally just direct sow them and they're magical. Uh-huh. I just love them. They're easy. The sunflower, sometimes we just use in substitution of a corn and the three sisters. They ha- they're as the tower and the deep root system kind of acting the same for beans to climb on. And that's a great crop trap. Sometimes in autumn, trap for crop, crap, crop, <laughs> Not crap, 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 crap. The one that attracts the beetles to it. It's a good yeah, yeah. nectar, I guess. Yeah. Well, I remember when we did a uh, ever bearing strawberry, and you know all the squirrels, everybody hungry in springtime when the strawberries were starting, and get that ever in the ever bearing, you get that autumn, late summer, autumn season. And squirrels could care less about strawberries in September because they're getting ready for winter. Interesting. So they're going after the sunflower seeds and we'd grow the big mammoths, the big, you know, dinner plate size sunflower mm-hmm. heads loaded with thousands and thousands of seeds and go have at it. And you get that, th- all those seeds are yours. Stay off the strawberries. So you gave away the spring strawberries to the squirrels, knowing that you would have the you September save, strawberries. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's also very interesting. Instead of like, you know, trying to kill the squirrels, being like, fine, have the strawberries now, but then we're going to have the strawberries later and you can have the sunflower. It's a negotiation. In fact, I, I mean, I noticed it last year was we did our corn last year was getting just annihilated by squirrels. Mm-hmm. I was like, what's going on? We didn't have sunflowers in the ground. In fact, I found all those sunflowers. We have twice as many sunflowers oh. than we need this year. That was an oversight on our, yeah. But it was kind of like, again, we were like, why didn't we do sunflowers? Oh, we must have just overlooked it. But here there were the squirrels eating corn. We're going, they've never done this before. Mm. Well, what's missing was the sunflowers. They'd rather take the seed home and save it for later right. than eat strawberries or corn now. So, yeah, using that, 
we'll plant them anywhere. In fact, they're a great cover crop as well. We have a section plan this year. It's a brand new bed. And rather than cover crop, we're saying, let's just do the whole thing packed tight with, with sunflowers. And rightfully so, it's a bed right next to the fence, right next to the woods where the squirrels are going to come in and the rest, you know, boom, perfect. And those squirrels and chipmunks, they have very little idea where they're putting all these sunflower seeds. So it's a great way to also spread the sunflowers in yeah. the garden. Uh, a yes, little pocket of the raised bed and you get 40 sunflowers pop out the next spring. You know Oh my why. God, I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> I love sunflowers so much. We talked about roses. So a companion plant for rose. So I guess in your method, the rose, would the rose be the star? Or if would you're the growing rose roses, flower? most likely people yeah. are considering that as important as we consider the apples or the tomato in the vegetable garden. That's the main act. So you're going to have to look for, yeah. So you're saying garlic and alliums are yeah, good? Yeah, I would just okay. stick with that as my answer for most, sure. Most people talk about a Japanese beetle issue. So, you know, yeah, you want the annual zinnias, or the borage or something like that. Dude, everyone should grow borage. Everyone try. I'm borage's biggest cheerleader after I've discovered it. We successfully did a cover crop of borage. So years ago, our chef wanted borage for microgreens. We bought a five pound bag of borage seed. We probably got four or five trays deep. And then chef said, I don't like these. Don't grow them anymore. <gasps> so that was last year. Yeah. Last year, we said, let's cover crop the section. What are we going to do it with? Let's try borage. It was a borage That's carpet. Awesome. And then those things were blooming and it became a bumblebee carpet. And then July came around, it became a trap crop for Japanese beetle carpet. And then chop and drop, compost and on you, top, put plants in the ground. And did you interplant with the borage? Or that was a no, full bed of borage. that was just a full, I mean, that was with a full five beds. With the intention of beds. just attracting all the stuff yep. and then letting it compost. Yep, let's, it cover, let's cover the soil while we're here and we'll attract the bumblebees. We'll get the blossoms for chef. We'll attract those beetles. And then at the end, yeah, I mean, I remember weed whacking that down and it just smelled like cucumbers. I smelled like oh, cucumbers for days. It's so um, good. And the iced I, tea, borage Yeah. Tea. What I really liked was they're like these really moist plants. They decayed super fast. Yeah. Like that was the, probably the fastest I've seen a plant where I've cut it to the ground. It was like the next day they were brown. And then a week later, it was just soil yeah. and it was cool. Let's, let's get the next crop in. That's so cool. Okay, so we talked about tomato being the star and a good setup for them. We talked about cucumbers. What are some other big corn? Obviously, is going to be the three sisters, which is beans and squash. What are other great pairings that have worked out for you guys that people might want to try in their containers or their home gardens? I mentioned the spinach and the strawberries. That was one that we haven't done since that year, but I have not forgotten about it. And I tell a lot of people about that because that was the timing on that was just perfect. And also for what grows together, goes together, like spinach, strawberry salad with some feta cheese or goat cheese. Come on now. There's actually a plant called strawberry spinach that has like a little red berry seed. It's a spinach crop, but it has an edible seed berry. And just the fact that these two, I don't know, mingle like that. again, And you just got to pick up on the cues. Mm -hmm. And one thing we've tried out last two years, better and better luck, is potato leek. Tastes good together. Grow it together. Oh, my God. Potato leek soup. So you're growing, the leeks are growing up vertical. So what would be, the, the potato would be the star in that? I think they're kind of co-stars, co-stars in that in that way. You think about okay. the soup, you need both. So And then what are the other elements that you're planting with them? So you've got the leek going up. You've got the potato in the ground. Yeah, I mean, you, the way we've done it is just the potato and the leek. We figure the leek needs some sort of, of blanching on the stem or else you get this little bulb at the bottom and it's all green leaf. So the higher you can put material and and in cultivation, leeks are usually buried and blanched that way and just a little bit of the leaves stick up. So the idea was that as the potatoes grew, that the canopy of the potato would do the blanching of the leeks. So just uh, putting the leeks in first, I mean, they're in the ground for a good month, month and a half before the potatoes get in. So they have time to establish, get big, bigger than at least a blade of grass. I know the first time we planted it, we couldn't tell what the difference between the leek and the blade of grass was. But last year, you know, the compost down and mulching and you're starting the seed separately and you're putting the seedling in the ground. Correct. Just to walk through the whole process. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Transplanting that leak in. And again, that's happening pretty early. You know, at this time in the growing season now, April could happen. And then a couple of weeks later, throwing that potato in, in the center. It just looks like a leak bed for a little bit. And then mm-hmm. the potatoes emerge. And then again, by, by midsummer, the potatoes are so big and the leak tops are just hanging out above the canopy, blanching the leak. And then again, you say, chef, we're getting ready for a potato leak soup. And we just harvest it all at one time. And when you say blanching, for those who might not know what that means, can you just explain it? In this particular case, it's the sun not hitting the plant. Again, it, in cultivation, they're just buried in dirt, up mounding, as it's called, where the top of the plant is just sticking out of the dirt. The more you did that, the more of that white, oniony flesh you'll get on the leek and not, not so much of the green leaf. You, you see it a lot with celery. In fact, celery gets held up a lot. What was the other one? White asparagus is just green asparagus that's never seen the light of day. 
They just put heavy mulch over top of it. That asparagus is just growing essentially underground. Okay. Uh, they harvest, so they just keep adding mulch yep, on top of it. When they go to harvest it, they just pull the mulch apart, and that just okay. remains white. The green is chlorophyll from right, sun. If it right. never sees the sun, it never produces that. And now you're left with white asparagus. I often get asked, do you guys grow white asparagus? It's like, no. We grow asparagus. Technically, right. nobody I mean, you grows could grow a purple white asparagus and make it white right. asparagus, right. too. So. Wow, that's so cool. One thing before we wrap up, this was so interesting. I love I think you gave us like five different companions. Also, I feel like something I just want to kind of reiterate, it's you guys experiment. And I feel like people watching, you know, Melody, I talk about my friend Melody a lot, who I gardened with. She said at the end of every gardening season, you should take one plant out of the ground and just get to know the roots. I'm like, write it in a journal, something so you can understand, you know, how your leek grows, how your herbs grow so that next year you understand that root system better. Because it sounds like what this companion planting is, is really just understanding how the plants grow, and then how to utilize that space with the tomato, how you were saying, moving it off to the side so you have more space for shallow roots, right? Which is something I'm totally going to do. So like experiment, everyone. As you know, I feel like these two guys that you've just listened to for an hour, hyper creative, curious, like that's what gardening is. And once again, we have every single year to experiment. One thing I just also, you just mentioned succession planting, the difference between companion planting and succession planting. And do you just have a couple of tips for succession planting for everyone as, you know, this episode airs at the beginning of the gardening season, maybe late summer into fall? Yeah, I mean, take a look at days to maturity. And if a French breakfast radish only takes 24 days, know that once you pluck that radish and you start another radish seed, it's going to take another 24 days. But if you had just a few of those seeds started every week, you're going to have radishes throughout the growing season and seeds are cheap so taking your entire seed packet and like i said breaking it up into smaller successions you'll get a constant crop i know we have a lot of people asking us how do you keep the cilantro growing you know the stuff i planted in may is is bolted or dead so well so is ours <laughs> it's it, it only grow on. it's something again we're planting every two weeks you want cilantro all summer long you have to just kind of keep planting it so dill cilantro radishes salad greens we're doing every two weeks throughout the growing season. We get mad if we miss it. Yeah. I mean, it's for our scale, you know, it's in whole trays, but again, for a small garden, if you bought a hundred seeds in a seed packet, you know, mm-hmm. you break that up into 10 weeks. Yeah. Get... My house, I do it by the dozen. Plant yeah. a dozen seeds this week, a dozen seeds next week, a dozen week. seeds. Yep. I love my mom, who's a amazing gardener, but also like a low maintenance gardener. She buys her seedlings like at the store. She plants her basil, but when she plants the basil, she also has a seed pack and she plants the seeds around the seedling. And then every couple of weeks, I feel like that's a very like low maintenance. So when you buy the basil plant, you should also make sure that you have a packet of the basil seeds so that you can just keep replenishing that plant. And if you're like me and you have a husband who like lives off of pesto, you need to make a lot of basil right. all yeah. summer long. Yeah. <laughs> You know, also, my husband has at least a potato once a day. Oh, yeah? And so I've never grown potatoes. I haven't really had the space. I feel like grow bag potatoes is confusing. But I can't wait to have a potato bed one day. Uh, I'll tell you right now, potatoes are one of my favorite crops to grow. They're so easy. Do you think I can do it in I a grow you, bag? I think you can grow it in a garbage can. I've seen it in tires. I've seen it in tires. <laughs> seen it in tires. Uh, <laughs> Not so that I suggest that. Potatoes also, they really thrive with that hilling. So you have a potato. You're putting your chunk of potato underground. That thing begins to grow. The leaves come out of the ground. If you add more soil on top of that, mm-hmm. anywhere where a leaf comes off of that stem will actually die back and produce another potato. So in theory, you could plant a potato now and just keep dumping soil on top of it and, and just keep doing it and go vertical. So I've seen people do it with garbage cans, take a metal garbage can, put four inches of soil on the bottom take two potatoes, cut them in little chunks, mm-hmm. maybe have six on the bottom, add another six inches of soil. And then look, when that thing comes out of the ground and grows six to eight inches tall, fill it with soil until you right. can't see those leaves Similar anymore. to the asparagus, actually. Exactly. Yeah, okay. But that's just going to happen again. The potatoes are going to go, okay, I'm buried, produce more potatoes. They're going to send more shoots out of the ground. When you look in that can and go, oh, it looks like plants, cover it with soil. Eventually, by the end of the season, your entire garbage can will be filled with soil with potato plant coming out of the top. Beautiful thing about potatoes, we get asked all the time, my potatoes are turning yellow, they're dying, and we just laugh and go, we'll go harvest them, they're ready. Right. Plants telling you they're ready. And then at the end, you just tip that garbage can over. And you got I, potatoes. I watched the video. This guy started with two potatoes. He must have had 100 pounds of potatoes <gasps> by the end of it. Okay, fine. I'm doing it. And just it. dumped the garbage can over, lifted it up. I mean. I think there are grow bags for potatoes where you can actually 
open. There's like a patch okay. at the bottom. Open the bottom. I mean, I've heard of the tire method where people are actually just stacking. It's the, the same thing. They're stacking them on top of each other. You could start it in a tire, and then when they grow out, I've put another the tires tire on can top. Be a little toxic, though. You gotta I've be careful with that. unless good. they sit in the woods for like what was it? you did some research on how long it takes. It, yeah, it takes like I don't know. I mean, just the 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 really harsh stuff. It takes a couple decades. But I mean, sometimes you have properties around here. Then you have a couple uh, yeah, tires sitting around the woods. Yeah. Actually, we do have a few tires that are so sitting you, in our woods. If you need a tire, you come to my place. But, yeah. Tire. My place, there's a whole shed of okay. tires. <laughs> okay, <I'll laughs> tires just, tires. It's just the shape, if you could find something that's similar. Are the deer going to eat my potatoes? Likely the case. Okay, so I got to grow them on my balcony. Okay, okay. Until, they get, to, feel... until you get that stack six feet tall, and they might not be able to reach in there. Right. <laughs> I feel very excited about this. Well, this has been super inspiring for me. I hope it's been inspiring for you listeners. Where can people, you guys, are you on social media? Where can people find you? Derek's not. Do you educate for the Lodge at Woodlock? Every you day. You know what, guys? Every Come day to the here. Lodge at Woodlock. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, I've, I came here in January. I've been back three times. It's my birthday tomorrow. I'm spending my birthday here. I took my sister's bachelorette party here. I'm so obsessed with the Lodge at Woodlock. But come back just to tour the garden. You guys do garden tours, right? And gardening classes, yep. right? Garden tours, garden classes. I mean, we have a whole class schedule. We have a whole tour schedule. But you come down to that farm and you see someone here. Yeah. You bet your bottom dollar we're going to talk your ear off. I love it. That's, we've that's done our, it before. Yes, we've done it before. <laughs> it's our best crop as the guests. I mean, that's what we are, our main focus is and spreading this. And The programming here is so crazy. I told Billy, we're just staying here for two days. And I told him, I was like, okay, we're doing hatchet throwing at three. We're doing spring foraging at four. I'm going to go do candlelit yoga at five. And then tomorrow we're going to do the wildflower walk. We're going to do detox yoga. Like you could literally, you could learn all day. And he's like, seriously, Maria? And I'm like, yeah, it's my birthday. What's beautiful is you can do whatever you want and, and then he, he can, can do whatever golf, he wants. Exactly uh, what even if doing. even if he wanted to sit in an Adirondack chair exactly. in a robe, exactly. no one's going to stop or just you. Gonna, he's going to go live in that sauna. I know. This has been so fun. I hope I get to come back in July. Maybe we can have an update episode because I feel lucky that I've seen it in the winter. I mean, I've, I've kind of seen the garden at two out of the three seasons and not even the exciting season. Yeah, so I've right, got to yeah. come back. Thank you so much. The Lodge at Woodlock. We'll put all the links in the show notes. You guys have been so awesome. And I can't wait to talk again soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much to Sam and Derek for this conversation. I tr- We all joked once I stopped recording, we easily could have sat in that orchard for another hour and a half talking about plants. But I had to go because I had to meet Billy at Axe Throwing. <laughs> the Lodge at Woodlock has an incredible... When you arrive, it's this like all-inclusive place. And when you arrive, you get the spa that has this incredible amount of activities. And there was axe throwing and I knew Billy would really want to do that. So I had to keep the conversation to around an hour and 15 minutes because we had to go axe throwing, guys. And then I had to go do a meditation. And then I had to go frolic through the forest. That visit, we also did a spring foraging class, which was really cool. They had an herbalist that walked us through all of the different edible plants that were available on the property or that we might see in our lawn and garden. Stay tuned. I actually might interview her for the podcast as well. But if you're curious, I mean, I can't recommend the Lodge at Woodlock enough. I feel like the endorsement is the fact that I've gone there three times in the last four months. More information, I'm going to read you the little bio that comes off their website. It's a luxurious, all-inclusive destination spa resort in Northeast Pennsylvania. It's known for its spa treatments, outdoor experiences, fitness and wellness activities, art classes, cooking demonstrations, golf. Oh yeah, Billy went and played golf on my birthday weekend and more in a pristine mountain retreat environment. It's on over 500 wooded acres with a private lake. It provides an oasis for personal awakening and renewal just 2.5 hours outside of New York City. The accommodations are to die for. The bed was so comfortable. If you are interested in seeing, I made a little reel for my birthday weekend that you can go check out on my Instagram. I'll leave it in the show notes. You can also call 1-800-WOODLOCK, W-O-O-D-L-O-C-H, or visit thelodgeatwoodlock.com for more information. I'm really hoping to go back sometime this summer so I can go see the farm in full swing. Maybe they'll let me interview them again as well because they're so much fun to talk to. But thanks again, Lodge of Woodlock. My birthday stay was amazing. These guys are so great. I am so excited to take that planting, that grow bag planting tip that they gave me in the conversation to my grow bags once our frost date passes so I can get planting. So plant friends, whether you're gardening indoors or outdoors, whether you're growing houseplants or growing edibles, I hope you take something away from this episode. Maybe you take two plants that you didn't know would grow well together. Maybe you experiment making some different arrangements of different plants together. 
let me know on social media how that goes. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast, so I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to clean up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group, so if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section, plus the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will Will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. 
This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test. Because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible. So I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 